This is a great conference, and it's wonderful. It's in Boston. This is one hell of a town. After all it's been through this week, you just walk outdoors and you just feel everybody's back stronger than ever. And I also wanted to say, Mary Zanarini is one hell of a woman. <laughs> because, it's true. Because on uh, the days get mixed up now. On Friday, when the whole city was locked down, I kept <laughs> emailing Mary. <laughs> And she had this confidence, what great internal representations, that turned out to be, in fact, in sync with the external reality. So thank you for organizing this, Mary. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes, I hope not too long, to introduce the model of treatment. And um, I'm hearing a lot of, if it's a too loud, turn it down, or maybe I'm still trying to wake up. But um, I'm going to talk about transference-focused psychotherapy. And as Perry said, transference-focused psychotherapy has been around a long time. It's a little bit like the sleeper, because it's been there, and it's been a little bit behind the scenes in many ways. And to many people's surprise, it's evolved. It's not the same thing it used to be. And I think one of the reasons it's been a little bit behind the scenes is it's based on a psychoanalytic tradition, which in many uh, parts of our field is synonymous these days with old-fashioned and ineffective, but TFP has evolved in many ways that I think make it quite current. So let me describe the treatment. First of all, what do we aim to treat with this type of therapy? Borderline and other severe personality disorders, specifically narcissistic, which we're focusing on now in quite an intense way. What is our conceptual frame of reference? We refer to psychodynamic object relations theory, which is essentially a focus on the internal images that every individual has of themselves and of others. What changes, at least as far as we understand it, and how? We feel that with this therapy, we, go from, we help people go from a fragmented sense of self to a coherent one through re reflection on the experience of self and other in the moment, in the session. Um, continuing to describe the treatment, it's a twice weekly individual therapy. We set up, we negotiate a treatment contract in the initial phase of treatment. I'll talk just a bit more about that later. And we have the possibility of adjunctive treatments such as a 12-step program or perhaps eating disorder. Uh, component. And um, I'm going to say in a second, though, that although it's a twice weekly individual treatment, in fact, I'll say right now, some of our students have discovered it can be applied across the board in any psychiatric setting. This just came out a week or two ago in a journal called Psychodynamic Psychiatry. Some of the residents we taught at Bellevue realized they could take the concepts of TFP and use them in the ER on acute units. So I would recommend this paper to people, Transference Focused Psychotherapy in the General Psychiatry Residency, a useful and applicable model for residents in acute clinical settings. That's part of what I meant when I say we're adapting all the way. Now, to continue to describe the therapy, what's the stance of the therapist? To use a somewhat charged term, it's neutral, but that doesn't mean indifference or uncaring. Neutral means that you do not take sides with any of the internal parts of a patient's conflicts. We feel that patients are always torn by conflicts, wanting to do one thing, wanting to do another, wanting to do one thing, feeling inhibited or prohibited from doing it. So we try not to just say, oh, it's better to do this or not do that. We try to help them see the elements of the conflict so they can grow by resolving it themselves. So we have this what might seem like paradoxical therapeutic stance, which is neutral but active. <clears throat> We're quite active in our participation in sessions. Our treatment technique consists of setting up a safe frame within which to work. This frame allows affects to be experienced in a very intense way, so we're containing and increasing awareness of intense affects. And eventually, we're interpreting contradictory self-states and contradictory views of others. Now, just to simplify, because I can't give you a whole course on this, our focus is on an individual's identity, their sense of self. We feel that in borderline pathology, the sense of self and of others is fragmented 
distorted and superficial. Hence, a difficulty accurately reading others, figuring out what's going on in the other's mind, and also a difficulty reading one's own self-states, often states of being that can't be tolerated are either enacted, acted out, or they're dealt with by projection, perceiving the part of the self that's not fitting in with the rest as coming from the outside. Therefore, people go through life with a lack of continuity of experience and a terrible sense of internal emptiness because of the lack of integration. So there's a vicious cycle of a temperamental, we of course respect the biological components, a temperamental predisposition to emotional dysregulation that combined with distortions and perceptions, as we know from research, people tend to perceive things negatively when they're not. This creates a vicious cycle of ne negative experience in life. And we hope to intervene with that. So we try to help people get identity consolidation and coherence. We try to get them to get more adaptive defenses or coping mechanisms, ways of managing stress and internal conflict. We feel that this awareness of affects and the integration of identity leads to increased modulation and control of emotions and affects. And eventually, this all we find leads to better adaptation to the life challenges of satisfaction and work and love. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a theoretical background that will help you, I believe, understand the interview. We talk about the structure of the mind, how the mind is made up, and by that I mean how people perceive self and others, what leads to their way of taking in and reading self and others. And we feel this is based on something we call the object relations dyad, <clears throat> which is an internalized experience of the self in a particular state, an internalized experience of the other in a particular state, bound together by very intense affect. We find that internal um, experiences are internalized most intensely during moments of high affect. So what happens is these internalized relationship patterns become modified by aspects of the mind, by fantasies and defenses. We do not feel these representations of self and other are just a simple, accurate historical representation of what happened. They're exaggerated, they're distorted, they become even more powerful in the mind. These dyads, these internal representations of self and other, influence how the mind processes interpersonal information. The uh, self's perception of and relation to the self is very much determined by internal representations. The people who say, I hate myself, what is their internal representation of themselves? What is it? It's none of the, uh, their environment probably agree that they're so hateable, but they have a particular representation that's very rigidly entrenched in them. The self's perception of and relation to others is also influenced by these internal images. The, you know, the famous Donegan research where you show a neutral face, it's perceived as negative. That we feel is based on an internal representation that has a negative uh, association to the image of the other. So as we will probably see in the interview, the abandoner abandonee dyad is just one of many possible internal representational uh, states that gets activated even if the external situation doesn't call for it. To go just a little further, dyads, relationship paradigms of a similar emotional charge group together in early development, and we feel this is the that people with borderline personality get stuck in this, what we call, split internal world, where things are either all good and perfect or all bad and a total disaster. Putting it in slightly other terms, these are dissociative ways of coping. We talk about dissociation in our patients and the fact they use dissociative defenses, that is, to be totally out of touch with one aspect of themselves when they're experiencing another. Now, in uh, the kind of psychological development one would hope for, we go from this split internal world where there's an exaggerated sense of what is good and should be, and an exaggerated sense of uh, what is bad and too often present, we go to what we call an integrated state. However, before giving you the slide on the integrated state, I want to point out 
that in spite of all the turmoil and distress in borderline patients' lives, at least the way we see it, they hold on, and I would argue that Katie holds on to an image of something ideal that she longs for, and that really trips people up. I think sometimes um, you could see borderline patients as failed romantics. They were looking for some ideal and they trip up all over the place, or to quote an old song, looking for love in all the wrong ways. That's a slight paraphrase. Um, but we hope to go from this split state to an integrated state where things are good enough. You accept yourself with your imperfections. You accept others as people not being ideal, and if they disappoint you, they don't hate you. So we're really trying to get people to come to this broader, more rich, more nuanced, and more real sense of self in others. So what is transference in all of this? Transference is the activation of these internal representations of self and other in the relationship with the therapist. We know from too many endless psychoanalyses that if you just interpret ideas, nothing changes. That's my point of view. Perhaps we should delete that from the video because I don't, I don't want to get in trouble with all my analyst colleagues. But anyway, uh, what we have found is that if you've got the affect in the room with you, if the patient is experiencing you a certain way and you can comment on it as they're feeling it, it's much more likely to affect, it's make a dent in how they really think and feel. So we work in a way that's experience near. What's going on in the room? Of course, we don't talk exclusively about that, but we try to observe and bring to awareness the internal relationship representations that emerge between the patient and the therapist. Of course, there are triggers, but we find that the response to the trigger can be quite impressive, as I'll tell you in a minute. We go by the uh, old saying, this is an old saying if you follow Otto Kernberg, an affect is the manifestation of an underlying imagined relationship. If somebody's sad and depressed, they might have a major affective disorder, but they might be living with an internal representation of self and others that's full of criticism and rejection. So we find that affects are very related to the internal relationship patterns. When working with the transference, we have all in one place the emotion, the perception, and the ability to encourage reflection on it all at the same time. We're trying to help patients gain and tolerate awareness of their internal representations, which they just take for granted and assume are objective reality. We try to integrate them into a whole identity with all the nuance and richness of the world. And we try to generalize this experience to other relations. Now, this is a little diagram of what you'll see in these two chairs. You've got the patient on the left. The whole thing, by the way, is the patient's mind. But on the left is the patient's experience of self, and on the right is their experience of the therapist. You let yourself be what we call the surface of projection so that the patient can see you however they wish. And then you hover over the whole scene and try to help them observe what they're making of the situation. Quick example, I had been seeing a woman for a few months, and for the first time I started a session late. There was an emergency, I was five minutes late. I opened the door to the waiting room. She comes in furious. This is the last session, I'm never coming back. Trigger was that I was in fact five minutes late opening, uh, opening the door. I said, well, well, tell me more. She said, now I have proof you hate me. So to, the trigger was the five minutes of my lateness, but this provoked what we call the projection of an internal representation. The person who can't stand her wants to get rid of her as soon as he can. And she said, I knew all the time you hated me, but you were pretending to be okay with me. Now keeping me away five minutes is the, so this is the kind of thing you try to get somebody to reflect on and see if it might in fact not be the real case and so on and so forth. Now, these are new slides because for those of you who are part of this world who go to all these conferences, what I've said is a little bit of repetition, but we've decided to get animated. So here is a typical dyad. The patient experiences self as the victim of CJ stands for critical judge. So, you know, walks into the session, can't say anything. Why is it hard to talk? I know whatever I say, you're gonna 
you think badly of it, you're going to find fault with it. So projection of the critical judge. But what we notice happens later in ways that might not be so subtle, uh, that the critical judge exists within the patient, patient of mine who took one look at me one day and said, I guess you're never going to wear that tie again. <laughs> anyway, so there was a little bit of an element of critical judge in the patient now, which they're not so aware of. And then <clears throat> the same critical judge gets projected into the external world. I can never, patient of mine who dropped out of college four times because she thought she wasn't doing well enough when she was actually doing fine, but she just felt she wasn't doing well enough. And then, so anyway, the critical judge is experienced as coming from the external world, but the bottom line here is that the whole drama is within the self. And we try to get people to see that what they're experiencing in relation to us and in relation to the external world is always a drama within themselves. Now, it gets a little more complicated. We get the same little dyad here, victim, critical, judge. All right. But we assume there's more. We assume, as I told you, there's this ideal segment of the mind. So behind this wall of defenses, there's the love child and the perfect caretaker. Now, in the course of therapy, usually, we find that in a sort of subtle way, uh, it's not always so obvious, there is a positive relationship that develops. And as that develops, there's this flipping back and forth. But in, in sessions, sometimes we're, you know, like uh, Santa Claus and sometimes like we're the devil incarnate. And with this flipping back and forth, we try to get people to observe the changes of how we're perceived. And eventually the defensive wall lessens <coughs> with the help of interpretation. And these extreme representations of self and, us, uh, and other merge into realistic self and realistic other. Just a couple more slides if you bear with me. What do we do? We set up a structure. We negotiate the treatment frame. We establish goals. We're not just doing free association. We follow the patient's affect. We think affect is the key here, uh, more than thought, at least at the beginning stages of treatment. Then we go through the interpretive process. We clarify internal states. OK, what is it that's going on in the moment, how you're feeling? We do bids for reflection. We used to call this, and sometimes in a shorthand, we still call this confrontation. Let me give you an example. What people tend to think we mean by confrontation would be if I said, you know, Mary, what the hell did you were you thinking when you scheduled us to be here at 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning? <laughs> that would be a bad confrontation. A bid for reflection would be, you know, Mary, I've been wondering. I know that you want us all to have a wonderful experience in Boston here for the first NAS SFPD conference. On the other hand, you schedule us all to be here at 7. I can't quite figure out how that fits with us having a, typical, a totally wonderful experience. Can you help me? <laughs> explain the difference. And we might discover, this is a wonderful thing, you never know at the beginning what's behind things, that Mary was so giving that she went on to give and give and give, and she gave so much that we had to wake up real early. Or we might discover that Mary has a little military, military drill sergeant part of herself <laughs> that was being enacted. So we have to learn what's behind. Anyway, then we interpret. We'll talk about it later. Perhaps, <laughs> can we have a session? <laughs> In any case, we interpret this lack of integration, these contradictions, and we try to help the patient observe the conflicts without taking a side. And we use our own emotional reactions. We call it countertransference because that gives us a lot of information about what's going on inside the patient. Now, is there a point to all this? Because sometimes people say it's just so complicated. But we have found in three studies now that TFP is associated with changes in social cognition in addition to symptom change, specifically changes in reflective functioning, attachment security, and narrative coherence, the patient's ability to have a coherent story. And these, uh, to date, these changes appear unique to TFP, so we think there might be an added value. 